this clip uh, answers or provides the answers to the exercise questions for the IV estimation exercise class. So here I copied the first question. We have a very standard regression model, uh, y dependent variable, x explanatory variable, and we have a matrix of instruments. That's the uh, the set here. Uh, we are also being told that they have identical dimensions, so we are working in the exactly identified case and the, you can see from the estimator equation that is the equation for the IV estimator in the um, exactly identified case. Identified case. So the question here is, uh, is this guy consistent or not. So what we're gonna uh, and we have two extra bits of information here: prob probability limit of these two terms, uh, x prime epsilon and z prime epsilon. Now, x uh, prime epsilon this turns out to be unequal to zero. So this is the problem maker. Okay, this is the reason why we need uh, instrumental variables estimation uh, set prime epsilon is equal to naught, that is one of the conditions uh, we impose on uh, the instruments. They have to be uncorrelated to the to the error terms. Perhaps uh, one word on this uh, prob probability limit uh, term. Let me just briefly give you a review of that. And I shall explain that with reference to our uh, parameter estimate, oh, I now see there's a little hat missing, to our parameter estimate uh, beta hat. So what we want is that that beta hat IV, we want this to be, you know, basically a, a consistency argument, and then I'll uh, explain the PLIM uh, with that, with reference to that. We first to the relation between the beta hat IV, our estimator, and our unknown population parameter beta. So in fact, what we want is that the difference of these two guys becomes very, very small. Now, so we are looking at the difference of these two guys. Um, we want it to be small. Now let's introduce some uh, term, let's say delta, and we want that the difference between that is smaller than uh, is smaller than delta. Now, what we now want to say is that, as our sample, you know, consistency is a, a large sample argument. So we want to say something about this relationship here as the sample size goes large. So we'll say in the limit as n, our sample site goes large. What do we want to happen? And now we are referring to, because our estimator is a random variable, so we basically have to make a probabilistic statement. We're saying that the probability that this is true converges to 1, to the value 1. So, and now what we haven't mentioned yet is any properties of this of this delta. And basically what we are saying, if something in, in the limit, the probability goes to one here, we're talking about the probability limit, we want this to be true for any delta. Okay, so delta can be as small as possible, as small as you can imagine, eventually as the sample size it's large enough, the probability that our difference between our estimator and the true value is smaller than that, whatever small value it is, should be equal to 1. And a different way of writing this is the probability limit of beta hat IV should be equal to beta. Okay, so these are two equivalent ways of writing the same way. Now perhaps just a little graphical ex a little graphical explanation. 
we have we know our beta hat iv is a random variable so we'll describe that random variable with distributions so you could think of you know for any sort of sample size you could think of that distribution to look like this what we want is you know that is ideally centered around the un uh, unknown population parameter. If it is centered, it's what we call an unbiased estimator. But we know consistency isn't doesn't exactly say that. What does consistency say? It says that you know as we get larger and larger uh, sample sizes, as we get a larger sample size, well, what will happen is that this distribution will get more centered. And as the sample size gets larger, we'll get even more centered. And at some stage, we want that this distribution gets so centered that basically, you know, whatever distance we are considering between the true, un true but unknown population value and our estimate that the probability that this distance gets extremely small is basically one. This is what our prob probability limit says. So what does that now mean with respect to these two these two statements? That means that we have two terms here. We know in one case this guy here okay, will not, if you have a large sample this guy will not converge to zero. Okay, so that x prime epsilon will not converge to zero, whereas this guy for large sample size it will converge to zero. Okay, so this is what these two guys say. So now back to our problem. We want to show that this is consistent. Basically we want to show this. Okay, so firstly we do our usual trick have our beta hat iv z prime x inverse z prime y but now we'll replace the y with our model x plus uh, epsilon so we substituted one in our definition of the iv estimator Uh, this of course immediately leads to z prime x inverse z prime x beta plus z prime x inverse z prime epsilon. Now we can see these two guys cancel out, so we have a beta left, and here on the right hand side we have z prime x inverse z prime epsilon left. And we can see that if we if we wanted to establish unbiasedness, we would take expectations here. Okay, and then we would need to know whether the expectation of this is zero. Now we are talking we're having a large sample argument. Um, argument in the limit, what we want to do is we want to take the probability limit of um, so the p limb of beta hat iv. So what we get on the right hand side, probability limit of a constant will just be a constant. The constant, whatever sample size we have, will be exactly equal to itself. So it will just be its own probability limit. Now, here remember our random terms. This first term is not going to be a random term. We'll just observe this. Okay, what's important now is the probability uh, limit of this guy, z prime epsilon. Now this is not, we don't have any information of this yet, okay, what we have information here is probability limit of 1 over n z prime epsilon. So to make this useful, we will have to introduce a scaling factor, basically what we want here is p lim, let's just use a different color for this, uh, 
1 over n. So prime epsilon. Now to make this uh, to make this work, we will have to and to make sure that the equation is still honored. We will have to introduce a 1 over n here as well. You realize that's to the power of uh, negative 1. So these two guys will cancel each other out. But now we know that this last guy here, that probability limit will in fact be equal to 0. We know this from up here. And therefore we get the result that the whole thing is equal to beta okay then whatever that is multiplied by zero well, okay with a small qualification so here we have the probability limit of beta hat iv is equal to zero uh, one extra note of course to calculate beta hat uh, what you want so perhaps we should add a note of caution here um, to be able to uh, to do this calculation, what we need, we also need, we also need z prime x to be uh, to be well. We need z prime x to be invertible. invertible that means uh, prime x should be square and that means they have to be of the same dimension z and x have to be of the same dimension but we uh, we said that already and should be full rank should be square and full rank okay so that's the extra condition we need here okay that's question one so let me now go continue to question two. Question two will basically illustrate one of the cases which we briefly discussed in the lecture, sort of cases where we may have problems with uh, endogeneity, with endogenous explanatory variables. Let's go here. So this is question two. And here's the description. We have a model. It's sort of a macroeconomic model. We have consumption, uh, disposable income, and we have a non-consumption expenditure. And we want to build a consumption model. See, there's an, a somewhat unconventional way of writing this, uh, but this is uh, nothing else but, um, let's say, x times beta plus epsilon, where uh, beta is defined as beta naught, beta 1, and x, x has uh, two columns, columns of 1 and a column of d. Okay, and then this is uh, exactly the same model, just a different way of uh, writing it. So we'll relate the consumption to disposable income, very traditional sort of way of writing down a uh, um, potentially macroeconomic consumption function. But that, there's one extra important bit of information now, uh, sort of identity in our model. And so of course very simplified um, sort of closed economy model. Uh, our disposable income is either consumed or non-consumptive expenditure that may be um, invested, okay, may be invested as well. So, uh, and that uh, identity is always valid. So we have one additional assumption that um, said expenditure, non-consumption expenditure is uncorrelated to the, um, to the error term in the consumption function. Okay, so what we now want to show is that uh, an OLS estimator of beta, okay, so if you were to estimate 
beta hat by all s that this will uh, give us an inconsistent or biased estimator. So let's firstly write down what our all s estimator is. And we know it's x prime x inverse x prime bar written from, from this form, but let's keep writing from this from this form. That will make life later a little bit easier. You could start from x prime x inverse x prime bar as well. So firstly x prime is now 1 d okay one that's a vector of ones and prime that's the prime of x and x is one d and then we have an inverse here and we have x prime one prime d prime and uh, times c okay so this is just the same as x prime x inverse um, C. So, as uh, usual, uh, let me just continue down here. As usual, what we do is we, for C, we replace our model. So we get beta hat all s equals d prime one d. Okay, it's a little bit more writing at the beginning, but it will help us later. But as I said, I could do the um, with x and x prime as well. And now c, of course, is just one d beta naught beta one. Okay, and then we can do the usual thing and factor out that last bit here and oops I, for, I forgot something uh, oh no, that wasn't the uh, eraser where's my eraser here's my eraser um, what I of course forgot was the epsilon so we have a plus epsilon here. So, um, so the first thing is we factor out this guy. You can already see this guy and this guy will cancel out and we are left with just beta naught beta 1 and then we get the, the first term inverse of that times um, oops, 1 prime d prime and then that guy times the epsilon okay so let us now so how do we continue from here Let's make well, from the first questions you, you've realized we, we should for large sample arguments we should really make a um, um, a argument with the uh, probability limit. What we do here is we treat this as a small. Uh, you see the uh, assumption which is given is really a sort of a small sample. Uh, assumption the expected value is equal to zero so we are we're not referring to any large sample argument so what we now need to do is we need to form the expectation of beta hat over less and uh, expectation of this initial parameter vector that's unknown but it's a constant that's just what it is and then all this part is non-random so we can get that outside the expectations operator uh, inverse and then we have the expected value of 1 prime d prime epsilon so in here so you can see everything now hinges whether that the expectation of beta hat hat all s is equal 
to this guy okay and if so it would be unbiased all depends on whether this term on the right hand side disappears now what does that depend on it will depend on this expectation let's look at this expectation it's sort of two bits we have two variables here we have the constant so the expectation of a constant and the error vector well that of course is going to be zero so the in, the decisive bit in here is this bit okay so let's just concentrate looking at this so the expected value of d prime epsilon so and now we're going to use information on our d okay we're gonna we, we will want to substitute for d want to substitute for d and we are using information from our identity uh, to do that so our identity I'll just copy it because if it just disappeared from from the screen this D is equal to C plus Z now C we had a model for this and what was that model that model was we said um, 1 D beta naught beta 1 plus epsilon that was our model for C and then plus Z as we have that on the right hand side now this one is of course nothing else but beta naught plus beta 1 D so it's 1 times beta naught plus D times beta 1 plus epsilon plus Z so what we have here is D is equal to this. Now we have D on both sides of the equation. We we'll want to uh, all get it over to one side, and it's pretty obvious what happens here. We have a if we bring that over, we'll get uh, D times one minus beta, and then we divide by one minus beta. So what we get is one minus beta one so plus epsilon plus z. So this is what we get on the uh, on the right hand side. Okay, if you've done any, uh, if you remember quite basic macroeconomics, uh, you'll see a multiplier appearing here. Uh, so what we now want, let's go back to to what we are after. Okay, we are after examining this this guy here. So, but now we know that that D is really this entire bit. So we know the expected value of D prime epsilon can now be written as the expected value, and we use square brackets uh, for the whole bit. And then we have, instead of B, we have one minus beta one, beta naught plus epsilon plus z and the whole thing prime well, so that's a replacement for d times epsilon so where do we go from here there's basically three terms here a constant bit beta naught times one minus beta prime epsilon so that's the expectation of that is going to be zero then we have um, that second bit, 1 divided by 1 minus beta 1 times epsilon, prime epsilon, well, that's an interesting one. And we have a third bit, 1 over 1 minus beta 1 z prime epsilon. Now we know from one of our assumptions that expected value of z prime epsilon is zero. So really the only thing that remains from here is this guy. 1 over 1 minus beta 1 epsilon prime epsilon and here we have a factor we can bring that outside the expectation all we are left with is this guy okay now what is this guy the expected value of epsilon prime epsilon this is of course nothing else but the variance of epsilon i okay and uh, this 
is of course going to be larger than zero. So what now? Let us think back. Where does that uh, where does that lead, lead us? Let me use a different color. Whatever we use that this one. Okay. So we know this is larger than zero. That means that this is larger than zero. That uh, means that up here, this guy here is gonna be larger than zero and certainly that's important for us unequal to zero and that what follows from here is that the expected value of beta hat over s is unequal to beta okay and that means we do not have an unbiased estimate of beta Okay, so this situation, so what was the situation? Uh, we started with basic model, but we knew that there was a relation, both the C and the D were related in a second way via this identity. Okay, so this, uh, this identity was important, and this identity eventually led to us establishing that an OLS estimator in this model will not be unbiased. So that was question two. So here we go with the third question of the IV exercise. So we have a regression where we regress the log wage on factors which we think explain variation in log wage, education, clearly thinking that this should be positive, the more education, higher your wage, and experience. Experience actually entering in, in a quadratic form. Uh, so it's not so easy to a priori say what these should be. Altogether, we would think that possibly we have rather positive effect. The more experience, the more the wage, although towards the end of a career that may tail off, which is why we possibly have this non-linear term. The issue is now that one of the assumptions is that explanatory variables are uncorrelated with epsilon. Now, that's clearly going to be the case for experience. Okay, that's a very deterministic variable there. Um, it's if as long as you're in work it's sort of function of your age and uh, that's possibly not a problem but let us think of why there may be a problem most likely because we, the variables we which we have omitted sort of certain particular skills you may require for a certain job or perhaps even more generically intelligence and of course there may be a number of other uh, planetary variables we have omitted but let's concentrate on these because especially this guy here is almost always omitted even if it is relevant for the left hand side and we would possibly think that intelligence has a factor on the wage that the more intelligent you would hope are rising higher in the hierarchy of a company so the problem is that most likely education and intelligence we would have to say are correlated with each other and therefore we have a breach of one of our OLS assumptions and therefore we know so if education and intelligence are correlated The consequence of this is that beta, now we have alpha, so let's uh, use alpha, that alpha hat is biased and inconsistent. So even in large samples, that bias does not disappear. So what we need is an instrumental variables approach. So we need a variable set that is uncorrelated to epsilon. Okay, remember in epsilon, importantly, we have this intelligence term, and we need a set that is correlated to education, but not relevant for the log wage.
Okay, so I'm going to write that as well. Irrelevant. Relevant for log wage. So that's the exclusion assumption. So let's do this in MATLAB. Here we go. I'll write a little uh, program. I should say if that XIV. We are importing the data. Let's do that. Let's have a brief look at the data. So we have 753 observations, 22 variables. Should also look at the MROTS test file, that's the description file. In here we have a list of all the variables. So for instance, log wage, the 21st column. Uh, let's have a pr quick look at the data. So you can see here we have sort of data and we should have 74753. That's at the end. You can see the NANC here. Let's see what variable is that. That's variable 7. Let's see where we have other NANs yeah, and 21. So 7 and 21. Let's see where that's important for us. 7 is wage and therefore 21 is wage. So this is log wage. So there are some observations so we don't have wage observations. Let's briefly look what they are. It appears as if they are ordered. In fact the first 4 to 8 observations we have wages and the last everything after that we don't. So therefore what we shall do is we curtail our data file to contain 4 to 8 rows only. So it's always worthwhile having a look at the data especially for these sorts of issues. Of course you could use the isnan command but the structure of the data is too easy. So first thing we want to do is we want to run the OLS regression here. Okay. So what we do, we use the OLS est function in doubt if you don't know what you need to do say help OLS est and we get a little help. So we need to input y, x and whether we want the output. So we'll say um, b equals all s est. We need a y, we need a x and yes we want to see the output but we need to define what y and what x are. So for y we want the log wage. We've already seen before that this is column 21, so we'll say data 21, all rows 21st column, x, here we want a constant, so here we'll certainly have data, let's see, education, education is the sixth, age is five, ah sorry, experience, so sixth, experience 19 and experience square 22. So we want 6, 19 and 22. 6. So there are two ways how you could do it. Column 6, 19 and 22. Or you could do a slightly shorter way you can say which columns do you want to pick 6, 19 and 22. Both these give you exactly the same result but now, so we use the shorter one but it doesn't really matter but now we also want a constant so we'll say ones n comma 1 so n should be our number of observations and perhaps we'll just define this up here at size data comma one comma one saying tell me how many rows you have we know it's four to eight but let's define it 
So then we feed this in and we run it and let's see what happens. That should work. So here we have our estimated our estimated model where we'll I explain about 16% of the variation in log wage. This is the constant, this is the coefficient to education. So one extra year of education has an impact of 0.1 log wage units. Okay, and we have an F stat that tests the assumption that all explanatory variables are irrelevant. That's clearly rejected. And we can see uh, T stats here, all assuming that there's no problem with heteroscedasticity. From the last lecture, you know that we should really check on this, but that's not the issue in this question. All right. Now, however, we know that we've estimated this model and we know it's a problem, it's problematic. We concluded that our coefficient estimate, so therefore also our estimate on education, is actually biased and inconsistent, most likely. So how would we do an IV estimation? So what we need for IV is we need this set that meets these conditions. So let's have a look what the variables are we have and whether we can see a candidate to be this IV. So we need it to be related to education but unrelated to intelligence of the particular worker in the sample. Now please have a look at this. I think the most obvious candidates are possibly mother's education and father's education. Now if you believe like me that possibly those who are more highly educated are possibly very keen to make sure that their kids get a lot of education then it's clearly that these two guys should be related to the education to six. Okay, Six, that's the education of the employee. Fifteen, sixteen, the um, education of the employee's mother and father. So, first question is, is that correlated with education? Now, we'll do, what we'll do is, we used, uh, we just need to know, what was that, 15 and 16. Okay, so we go over here, and what we'll do, say is we test whether education is correlated with mother's education and father's education. Now, since we want to check the correlation of one variable with more than one, what we'll do is I'll call this x2. We use regression analysis again. And in that regression al analysis, we use education, that is the sixth column, as our dependent variable. And we'll just copy this from up here and as explanatory variable we have we have a constant again but now we use mothers and fathers education what did we say 15 and 16 15 and 16 so let's run this so here we have oh sorry I haven't run the regression afterwards. So now I want to run the regression with y2 and y and x2. y2 is dependent, x2 is explanatory variable. So here we have our result. Three coefficients, constants, mother education, father education. They are positive. We have an r squared of 0.2. That's clearly larger than zero. We have an f-test here that clearly rejects the null hypothesis that these two variables are irrelevant. Therefore, success. Father's and mother's education do meet one of the conditions, i.e. it is they are correlated to education. Tick. So let's go back to our code. What we now want to do is we want to run an IV estimation. Okay where we use both of this uh, as instrumental variables. So we still use our y and x from up here, but what we now also need is a new set variable. Now that set variable will have an over-identified one. We have one variable, education, that's problematic, but we use two instruments. 
19 and 22 will stay in because we said experience we don't think we have a problem so in set we need to replace 6 and we'll replace that with 15 and 16 so this is now our set now we want to estimate IV we have this function IV est so let's just check help IV est what does help tells us what we need is y, x and z and we get three outputs BIV, BSE and R squared well just we only need the B's okay so what we do so y, x and z that's what we want to input estimate IV then we have IV est, we have Y, X and our instrument set and we call the result BIV. Perhaps up here we should call that B or less, yeah, just to be consistent. And let's run it. And So IVS actually doesn't automatically print out the results. You can see this is still the previous result we had. But PIV should be saved here. And you can see here it's four coefficients again. And let's compare that to the B or less, the ones which we had before. Here we go, why do we have only three? Hang on, I think I may have made a mistake. Oh yeah, I called B or less the one where we estimated. Let's do that again. Uh, education on father of mother education. I want B or less our original, the to be called the coefficients from our original model. So let's check B or less against BIV. So you can see the education coefficient was previously 0 0.1075. Now it is almost halved in size. Now perhaps what I also want to see, I, I really also want to see the the standard errors. So let me just see again, help IV est. That's the second output. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll will actually allow for all the three outputs B, S, E, I, V, that's the standard errors and perhaps we say R squared, I, V for the R squared. So we'll run again and we can see perhaps up here you can see our coefficient for education was 0 0.1075 with a standard error of 0 0.014 now we have BIV and our standard errors BS EIV now you can see the standard error is 0 0.03 so that means the t-stat is about 2 so it's marginally significant and the standard error is basically by a factor 2 larger in the IV estimation than in the OLS estimation. This is very typical and this comes from the fact that the instruments are possibly not very highly correlated with education. Well, we saw on, in the regression it was 0 0.2, clearly larger than 0. The, re, the R squared was 0 0.2, clearly larger than 0 but not very close to 1. So that's what inflates these standard errors but we can't do anything about it and we'd rather have a coefficient estimate that 0 0.06 which we know to be consistent as compared to one this one here which is possibly inconsistent and this is the question we're now gonna answer can we tell whether we actually needed an IV estimation was there a problem what we want to do is the Hausmann exogeneity test. Before we do that I just want to very briefly have a look into the IV est estimation. I just want you to see that there's no real magic happening in here. Uh, what you can see here from the lecture you know what we need is the projection matrix P set and that is defined here. Okay, Z was our instrument. We define the projection matrix calculate X prime projection matrix X and the inverse of that and then BIV is the result of this. Okay, inverse X prime P set times X times X prime 
projection matrix times y. That's the BIV and then uh, standard errors issues. Um, so this is really not a there's no magic going on, okay? But in practice, you don't need to know that as long as you know how to call the function ivest. So now we want to do the Hausmann test. The Hausmann test. The question is, what do we need for the Hausmann test? Let's see whether we can help Hausmann IV XR test could have given that a shorter name, but here we go. So what we need is vector with dependent variable, matrix with explanatory variables which you assume to be exogenous. That's the second input. Third input, matrix with explanatory variables that are to be tested on exogeneity, that's only education, and set matrix with instrumental variables. Okay, at least as many columns as X altogether. So what we're gonna do is we will be calling the Hausmann test. The output is a test stat and a p-value. So let's say HT for Hausmann test and HP for Hausmann p-value. Then Hausmann IV X on test and we need the Y and at the end was the Z sorry it was the Z but in there was X1 and X2 okay so that was the elements of X that were exogenous in X1 and those that are potentially endogenous in X2 so let's look at this is Again, what we're going to use is we're going to straight get these data from X. Now, exogenous, we have four columns here. The constant, education, experience, and experience squared. Okay, Constant, edu education, experience, and experience squared. Now, columns 1, 3, and 4, we think are exogenous. So, what we're going to say here is this is X, all rows, and columns 1, 3 and 4 and the one that we think may be endogenous is just the second column and what we'll do is we'll just let that be displayed display HT and that is display Hausmann test and uh, we'll also show the p-value and we'll actually we'll just put it right next to it. Okay, so h p. So let's run this. Here we go. Hausmann test, test stat of 2.8071 and a p-value of just under 10%. So what's the null hypothesis of the Hausmann test? The null hypothesis is that education is exogenous, so that we do not have a problem. What does that p-value tell us? A p-value tells us that at an alpha of 10%, we would reject that null hypothesis, because the p-value is smaller than the alpha. So at alpha of 10%, we reject the null hypothesis and we decide that education is endogenous. However, at a p-value of 5%, sorry, at an alpha of 5%, our p-value exceeds that alpha. So at 5% significance level, we would not reject the null hypothesis that education is endogenous. So what your decision is now depends on what your alpha is. Okay, so it's therefore, it's very important to Actually, before you do that, we should have done that before. Set yourself the alpha level. So the last thing I want to do, so this is a marginal case. Okay, I want to perform the sergeant test. And that is validity of instruments. 
Okay, remember we were saying we want to test are they uncorrelated to the error term. That is, here we asked, is education endogenous? So the sergeant test, again let us see what we need to help. Sergeant IV validity test, you could of course also open the file. Um, oh, uh, had a so. So what we need is the residuals from IV. X matrix with explanatory variables include vector of ones if you want a constant and set matrix with instruments. Okay, so that's what we have to hand hand in. Basically, X and Z just as for the IV estimation, but instead of the Y, we want the residuals from the IV. So, actually, we haven't defined that yet. Let's go back to the estimate IV section. And what we want here is we want resids IV, and that's going to be Y minus X times BIV. Okay, how do we calculate residuals? Dependent variable minus explanatory variable variable times coefficient. Now, of course, the x is a that's a vector, y is a vector, x is a matrix, and b is a vector. It has as many rows as x has columns. So everything suits. So residues IV. So we want this in the sergeant test. And what's the output again? Test that and p-value. So we have. ST for the test, SP for the p-value, then Sargon I, Sargon IV validity test. We want in there residues IV X and Z. Okay, as demanded. And then we'll do, we'll display that as well. Siren test S S. So let's run it. Here we go. Sargon test. What is the null hypothesis of the Sargon test? Of course, you refer to the lecture notes here. It is that the instruments are valid, i.e., the instruments are not correlated to the. Uh, error terms. P-value is 0 0.5 approximately, so clearly larger than any alpha you would choose. That means we do not reject the null hypothesis. That means the instruments are valid instruments. So that means at this stage we can of course conclude and correlate it to epsilon. Do this one. Okay, now I'm not going to test this last one. Okay, this is more based on logical argument. Okay, whether it's included, it's actually not so easy to uh, to test. It's not as easy as just including mother education, father education in this regression up here. So if we did so, we would still have the problem that intelligence and education are correlated potentially and therefore all the estimates would be biased. That means it would be impossible to test whether these two extra variables are significant or not. So that was the uh, worked example.